I felt like I, my body was just shutting down on me and there wasn't anything I could do about it. I can pinpoint the day, the time where I was. When I, I was running, I was doing a workout, and all of a sudden, I cannot feel my legs. I just felt terrible, dizzy, lethargic. As I understand it, I was making lots of blood clots, but they were so tiny you couldn't detect them. What is the treatment he gave you and how do you feel today? He put me on the triple anticoagulant therapy. Within two weeks, I, I felt like I had risen from the dead. This is Your Voice, Your Future, Full Measure Town Hall with Cheryl Atkinson. Welcome to a special Full Measure Town Hall, The COVID Clots. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. During the next hour, we'll be exploring leading edge research on a critically important topic that stands to impact millions. A concerning number of illnesses emerging after COVID, COVID vaccines, or both. Sometimes these illnesses are happening right away, but sometimes they're cropping up months or years later. It can be anything from vision problems, brain fog or fatigue, to seizures, heart attacks, or strokes. Many patients share common stories. Their physicians can't diagnose what's wrong or can't seem to find treatment that works. In a moment, we'll speak with a researcher who's unraveling some of the mysteries. Help could be on the way for many. First, we hear from some patients. That's around, down right there. Let me take a look at your eye. <laughs> If there's a singular person that first set the gears turning for Dr. Jordan Vaughn, it's Vandiver Chaplin. Big deep breath out. It was December 2020, shortly after his COVID vaccines. What were you feeling? Uh, I just felt terrible, you know, a dizzy, uh, lethargic, all those kind of things. And I was having some optical issues too. I, uh, my vision would just go blurry suddenly and then maybe a minute or two later it would clear up. You're kind of patient zero for Dr. Vaughn. Well, that's what he told me. All I did was go get my vaccines and react to it. So I didn't necessarily do anything special, but um, except maybe I feel like a meteor coming from space that I dropped down near Dr. Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn is an internal medicine specialist and CEO of MedHealth Clinics in Alabama. He ran some scans and other tests on Vandiver, his longtime patient, but didn't find anything abnormal. And at that time, I did some blood work, found that he had abnormal clotting issues. He was significantly short of breath. The abnormal blood clotting issues were there all along, says Vaughn, just hidden from view. As I understand it, I was making lots of blood clots, but they were so tiny you couldn't detect them. So I treated him as if he had something that I wasn't able to totally see, which would be smaller vascular issues and his symptoms significantly improved. So that really pushed me off on a, really a, kind of a, a journey to say, what is going on here? There's gotta be something there. Dr. Vaughn was on to something. By the time we visited his Birmingham practice, he and his team had treated more than 1,100 patients from athletes in their teens to people pushing age 90. We asked a few to speak with us. Yeah, Andy Sink, 55, had a, acute COVID that required hospitalization. Phil Williams, 58, he's treating my wife for blood clotting. I have congestive heart failure as a result of it. I had GI symptoms and heart issues. Many blood clots in my lungs. Okay, they report a wide range of debilitating after effects from COVID, COVID vaccines, or both. Some became sick right away. Others were hit hard a year or even two years later. Hannah Bourgeois, I'm 39, and I had um, shortness of breath from COVID. Dr. Greg Bourgeois and his wife Hannah, parents to five children, were vaccinated and got COVID. She became so sick, she was nearly bedridden for two years. I felt like I, my body was just shutting down on me, and there wasn't anything I could do about it. After a consult with the famed Mayo Clinic brought no improvement, Greg Bourgeois, a dermatologist who attended medical school with Dr. Vaughn, heard about what Vaughn was doing and sought him out to treat his wife. What did you learn was wrong with you? And in layman's terms, if you can kind of explain it to people who don't know about all the intricacies. So I learned that there were a lot of microclots kind of throughout my body that was just causing oxygen not to be able to get around very well. 
He was the first doctor that when I went to see him, he would finish my sentences for how I was feeling. That was so, I mean, I think I started crying the first time because that was so new and he understood and he, and he said, you know, it all makes sense. What is the treatment he gave you and how do you feel today? So he put me on the triple anticoagulant therapy and within a couple of days, I started to notice some difference, but within two weeks, I, I felt like I had risen from the dead. I mean, I, I got my voice back, I could walk. I could do things. And then to see the turnaround, it was pretty dramatic in a way that I personally have not gotten to witness a lot of in my career. Another physician who sought Dr. Vaughn's help is 88-year-old Donald Carmichael, a retired vascular surgeon and former professor of surgery at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He and his wife, Mary Alice, both vaccinated and boosted, say they got COVID more than once. The last time, a near killer for him. Thought he was not going to live through the night. Our son, who is a friend of Dr. Jordan Vaughn, said, we're not taking you anywhere else except to him in the morning. His treatment put him back in, basically in full health. And he was so giddy, I thought he had lost his mind. There are also young athletes. The case of 15-year-old Braden Little baffled doctors for two years. He's seen here suddenly collapsing on the court after COVID. After seeing Dr. Vaughn, he's so vastly improved, he's back on the road playing again. 19-year-old runner Ellen Redinger is hoping for a similar recovery. She's also a patient of Dr. Vaughn's after getting vaccinated, getting COVID, and getting very sick. I mean, I can pinpoint the day, the time, where I was. When I, I was running, I was doing a workout, and all of a sudden, I cannot feel my legs. I cannot feel, I mean, my heart rate is going 200. I can't do it. I call my dad, I'm like, I'm done working out. I can't, I can't do it. And I went for like three, four months of just feeling awful. You had to give up running, obviously, for right. a period of time. And I mean, I, ha I can't do any type of working out. I can go on a walk, but it has to be like a small, short walk um, for a short period of time. And if I do ever do it, I feel all I can do the next day is lay down. Dr. Jordan Vaughn joins us now. He is the physician who's treating the patients that we just heard from. You're not only CEO of MedHelp Clinics in Alabama, but you've started a new foundation dedicated to this work, the Microvascular Research Foundation. First of all, briefly, you're an internal medicine doctor, right? Correct. How did you get into this line of inquiry? So, I mean, I think at, at the onset, it was trying to figure out this new disease. Obviously, uh, an upper respiratory tract infection is what they called it in many sense, but it was causing a lot of other dysfunction. And I think just kind of diving down and trying to figure that out was why I kind of hit acute COVID and trying to figure out how that happened. But then after kind of conquering acute COVID, which in itself is not necessarily uh, conquerable. It has a lot of clots and a lot of uh, respiratory dysfunction that has to do with the vascular, vascular side of the respiratory tree. Um, I started seeing a lot of patients that continued to have issues. And um, that really, again, I kind of have an engineering background. Um, I'm kind of your old uh, internal medicine physician that really wants to learn and how, you know, to figure out what best to do for you. And as that research started to come in through the literature, it started to appear to be maybe something we could look into. To be clear, correct me if I'm wrong on any of these things that I'm trying to summarize, COVID, what we call long COVID, persistent injuries after COVID infection, and what some are now calling long vax, which are injuries that persist after vaccination or crop up months or years later, they can have similarities. So people may think, I didn't get vaccinated, I don't have the problem, or I did get vaccinated, but I didn't have problems right away. All of these people may be impacted. Exactly, and I think the fundamental pathogen, and we'll talk about this probably a lot tonight, is the spike protein. And in fact, what made COVID so dangerous is also what makes the vaccine something that also can cause significant issues. Because again, the spike protein itself is what's unique. It's what makes the damage, and it's what truly is the pathogenic mechanism of this virus, and unfortunately, uh, I guess the powers that be chose to use that same spike protein, and in fact, a pre-confirmational form of it, 
to vaccinate the population with. So you're getting it either way. You're getting it with a COVID infection or if you're vaccinated, your body is being told to make this problematic spike protein. Exactly. We'll talk more about the science in a few minutes, but we're going to be taking some questions from viewers in this town hall this evening. So let's do the first one from Beverly. She says, I've received the Pfizer vaccines and boosters. I've lost my sense of smell. I've heard that from a few people. I also experience a lot of coughing since having COVID, especially at night. Could I have clotting issues? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, uh, one of the places that is probably the most dense for the angiotensin receptor, which is what the uh, spike protein engages with, is in the sustenecular cells of your um, of your nose. Okay, please speak English. So, so yes, <laughs> and so again, a lot of the ability for you to smell, as well as the ability for you to breathe in and out. Uh, depends on small vessels operating properly. And if the small vessels are full of abnormal fibrin, and it basically, what I would say, sludges up the system, the system doesn't work well. Even things initially like cough. Cough is a symptom that a lot of people have. It's related to something going on in the lungs. Now, we always typically associate it with the respiratory tract infection, but just as likely it can be a sign that your lungs are trying to get rid of something on the vascular side. It can also be that's repairing. So a lot of times post-infectious coughs aren't necessarily something that is you're spreading anything, but instead it's a signal that there's something happening in the lungs and especially the lung parenchyma. Can you summarize why, in pretty simple terms, we think that so many people put on respirators early on died and why that basically doctors and ERs quit doing that after a while? So the initial thought was that this was a you know typical kind of acute respiratory disease. And in that case, actually, a lot of the damage is done in the actual airway part of your lungs. But in the other part of your lungs, just as important, if not more important, is where the vascular interfaces, the vascular system interfaces with that airway. And that's where the damage was happening with COVID. And especially one of my kind of mentors out of South Africa in June of 2020 said, we're barking up the wrong tree. He said, this is a vascular problem, not an airway problem. And he was right. And then one of the worst things you can do to somebody with a vascular problem with the lungs is to increase the pressure in the lungs because you're just going to close off more vessels. With a respirator. With, with a ventilator, exactly. And that's why most of the bad outcomes, I mean, basically, in many ways, a ventilator was a death knell. And the other thing about the clotting was the one thing that was kind of a signal to us was that a lot of people that were already on anticoagulants or antiplatelets were the people that survived hospitalization. Typically, those aren't the healthier people in a population, but for some reason, there was some protective effect that it offered them. So there's something about, is, are anticoagulants blood thinners, or that's a subset? So, so people who are on blood thinners to begin with and weren't, weren't that healthy going in sometimes had better outcomes after COVID, and people were trying to explain why that could be. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things. A lot of times you have an observation in medicine that gets you to ask a question because usually the people that were you know, more morbid in a sense, they had more medical conditions and when needed to be on blood thinners in the first place, why did they have better outcomes? And the answer was the pathology of the actual disease itself was related to clotting. So people are frustrated, I know. I've heard from a lot of them. They feel something's wrong. They go to a doctor. The doctor either can't see what's wrong with them because they look at the scans and it all looks normal or they know something's wrong, but they can't figure out what or treat it effectively. A lot of these people have found their way to you. What is it that you found, and how are you treating these patients in a way that the other doctors were not able to do? So a lot of it has to do with, first of all, listening to a patient and knowing what they were like before. And I think that was one of, my, one of the first people I treated, as you've probably seen in some of these videos, it's a lot of athletes. And the athletes and young people, it's pretty easy to discern that they've had a big change in their overall health because all of a sudden they were working out and being quite active and now they can't. So that I can't just explain away. Now, if somebody gets a little bit older, it's much easier for a physician to just go ahead and say, well, you, you might just be getting older and sorry, nothing I can do about it. But the reality is, is it affects everybody if they have it and it inhibits the ability for oxygen to get to tissues and nothing's going to work well if oxygen doesn't get to those tissues from your brain to your vestibular system, your balance, your hearing, all the way to your, the way your heart operates to, in a sense, even how your body recovers from exercise. Here's a problem I see. Young people or people without pre-existing health conditions, they know something's wrong after they have COVID and can't get better or suddenly get sicker 
or after they've been vaccinated and they know something's wrong. There are a lot of people out there that may have been aging or not in full health before all of this and may have something that's somewhat treatable or fixable, but they're overlooking it because they think this is just part of what happens to them as they grow older or their normal pre-existing conditions. Yeah, and I think that's true. And as much as uh, the patients that we show here are, are up and active, some of my greatest stories, I think, are the 84 to 86-year-old that don't have to go to an assisted living home or go to a nursing home because they couldn't take care of themselves anymore. Instead, they get back to health and live the last few you know, number of years of their lives without being dependent. And that's some of the greatest things I get is from their spouse when they realize, hey, we've got, we've got just like uh, Dr. Carmichael, got him back. And you've seen quite a few young athletes. In those cases, I think they may be the most obvious cases because they understand their bodies and they know that something's wrong, even if they've been to doctors who can't find anything on the scans. Exactly. And the one metaphor I always like to use, and I think I've used it before talking to you, Cheryl, is it's almost like you're standing in um, your shower at home. There's nothing coming out of your shower head and you call the plumber and the plumber uh, comes over to your house digs up your front yard and tells you the water main is open, why did you call me? And I think that's where medicine is. A lot of the things that doctors currently do is really dependent on being able to have a yes or no diagnosis. And a lot of the diagnostic equipment we have doesn't go down to the small vessel level and isn't really able to tell us what's truly going on at the tissue level. So just because the water main's open doesn't mean you can still take a shower. All right, very interesting. Our full measure town hall will continue after a short break. We'll have more from Dr. Vaughn, and also we'll bring in another second researcher who's made some enlightening findings of his own that could help you, so stay with us. And a lot of doctors are still living in the before COVID world where everything's in the textbook. But when you have a syndrome that, that comes before you and it happens to be associated with this new pathogen that everyone seems to have been in contact with, you've got to kind of open, open your eyes, open your ears, and also get into the literature and try to figure out what the heck's going on. The National Desk, a network of nearly 4,000 local journalists cover America's news now. Leaving this city frustrated with crime and homelessness. The National Desk team of impartial, unbiased, and fact-based journalists. Require car companies to make sure their safety systems worked at night. Choose America's news now, each weekday morning from the National Desk. We're back with our special full measure town hall, the COVID clots. Here's an explanation of some of the science behind the discoveries we're talking about involving why so many have mysterious lingering health problems after COVID and COVID vaccines. Together, Vaughn and his small team are unraveling some of the emerging mysteries that for whatever reason have become taboo to discuss in some practices, especially when it crosses into vaccine adverse events. I always say it's almost like there's two worlds. There's before COVID and after COVID. And a lot of doctors are still living in the before COVID world where everything's in the textbook. But when you have a syndrome that, that comes before you and it happens to be associated with this new pathogen that everyone seems to have been in contact with, you've got to kind of open, open your eyes, open your ears, and also get into the literature and try to figure out what the heck's going on. Vaughn thinks he's figured out why people who've had both COVID and COVID vaccines often seem to get the sickest. And it has to do with what's seen in these immunofluorescent images, something called fibrin. So we are designed all to make fibrin. Fibrin's one of the first kind of response mechanisms. Forms a clot if you're injured or yeah, something? It's like a, yeah, trauma, uh, infection, all those kind of things. You're going to make fibrin in, as a response to that. But the fibrin you usually make is, again, like spaghetti that just came out of the colander. But the fibrin that you make in response to a spike protein that's associated with COVID and the vaccine is kind of like burnt spaghetti with cheese in it that you have to get a Brillo pad and get it off the bottom of a, of a casserole dish with. And in that sense, that's why it's so unique. It's resistant to being broken down. Literally everyone, when they have the spike protein exposure from either the vaccine or from the infection, you're gonna make some of these amyloid fibrin. The question is who can get rid of them? And if you can't get rid of them, they sludge up the small vessels and inhibit the delivery of substrates 
And those are things like red blood cells, which carry oxygen. And so in that case, if you can't get oxygen to tissues, you're going to have significant dysfunction at every level. Dr. Vaughn is drawing from emerging research, and some of the research is confirming his own conclusions. Yale researchers recently reported persistent symptoms after vaccination, long vax, are similar to those reported with long COVID. Science Magazine writes, rare link between coronavirus vaccines and long COVID-like illness starts to gain acceptance. According to CDC, COVID vaccines instruct the patient's cells to make the same spike protein that's in COVID. This small RNA sequence, when injected into the muscle, initiates the production of spike proteins. The spike proteins, some scientists now say, are apparently causing damage through microclots months or years later. Back in December of 2020, a chilling foreshadowing from a Harvard-affiliated pediatric specialist. In a letter to the FDA just before the first vaccines hit the market, Dr. Patrick Whelan wrote, It appears that the viral spike protein created after COVID vaccines is also one of the key agents causing the damage to distant organs. He called for more research and warned it would be vastly worse if hundreds of millions of people were to suffer long-lasting or even permanent damage to their brain or heart microvasculature, small vessels, as an unintended effect of vaccines. And I think the silver lining of this is we're going to really start to understand what is happening there at the tissue level. You're basically not getting oxygen out to the tissues. Those tissues can be anything from your brain to your vision to your ability to take a big deep breath, all the way down to whether you can run or, or do other things. And the problem is, is when something affects every system, it's not, it's a little different to address it. And it takes kind of somebody who's, who can put the pieces of the puzzle together. Today, Vaughn and his team are fielding requests for help from as far away as Germany, conducting original research and sharing what they're learning. I speak to groups of a couple hundred physicians uh, every couple every month or so. Uh, I have uh, even round tables at night on Zoom with a bunch of physicians that are interested in what we're doing. Um, a lot of people that really care about their patients have realized uh, whatever they're doing is not working and we've got to figure out a way to help them. Joining me in Dr. Vaughn of MedHelp Clinics is Dr. Pierre Corey. He's a critical care physician and founder of another independent clinic treatment center called the Leading Edge Clinic. He's also president and chief medical officer at the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. Thanks for joining us. Now, while Dr. Vaughn was making his discoveries with his patients, were you finding similar things with your patients? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I started the pandemic in the ICU, and actually one of the first papers I wrote back in um, April of 2020 was really on the hypercoagulability or the, the real strong propensity to form clots. And this is in the most severe forms of acute COVID. So we, we already knew that there was a really severe clotting problems going on with these patients. Um, later, when I went into the care of these patients with long COVID or long vax, um, it's extremely complex, but like Dr. Vaughn is, is uh, identified with his colleagues, we understand that the, the clotting problems are a major uh, cause of the, the, pa the pathogenicity. Or, you know, pa pathogen is something that causes illness or symptoms, and that's a main driver. But I will say, though, that this syndrome is really complex. There's a number of other um, dysregulated systems that, that have uh, been triggered by the spike protein, including a dysregulated immune system, um, which could also, you could tie that back to the lack of proper blood flow. And then b beyond that, you know, the clotting problems, are, even just the clotting problems are pro complex, because one of the things that we noticed, um, and you know, I happen to be an expert on the drug called ivermectin, is that the red cells themselves tend to clump together. There's a receptor that get triggered by the spike, and you, so you see these clumping of red cells, which is not a common issue that we've seen in medicine. And ivermectin actually uh, kind of dispels those clumping. And so as Dr. Vaughn was saying, the sludging of the blood and the poor blood flow in the microvasculature, which can be uh, at the root of, of so many different symptoms, um, we see a number of different agents that can improve it. But it, it's all really acting on the, uh, on the sludging of the blood and the clumping of the cells. Well, then this is a good time to ask you another question from one of our viewers, from Ken. It's about ivermectin. He says, why was ivermectin and other known treatments so vehemently thwarted by drug companies in the FDA when hundreds of doctors believed they worked and were roadblocked at every turn? Yeah, I'm going to try to keep that answer short because it's a long answer. But, you know, um, I would say ivermectin, the, the, what happened to ivermectin is not new. Um, 
Repurposed uh, safe off patent medicines have long been attacked by the pharmaceutical industry because they threaten the profit potential of. Let, let me interrupt yeah. to say, isn't it true that with a novel virus, an accepted scientific path is to find a drug that's already in use and repurpose it, and it's faster than creating a new one? That would be the pragmatic approach. Um, the problem with that pragmatic approach is that it threatens the profits. Um, not only threatens the profits of the new pipeline drugs that they had planned, you know, things like Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, but the entire global vaccination campaign, which was the, the pre-planned response to a pandemic like this, is that they, it was always decided, uh, even before this broke out, that what was required was a global vaccination campaign to end this pandemic. And if, if the efficacy of ivermectin had been understood and identified and recognized, the EUA, the emergency use authorization for the vaccines, would have never been able to be, be issued. It, it requires the fact that there's no other alternative therapy. Yeah, so. I don't think people fully understand that, that if there is something that can treat a virus like this that's effective, then there can't be an emergency use of a vaccine. So if, if it had been determined that hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin were effective early on, that would mean, I guess, the government really couldn't or shouldn't approve the vaccines on an emergency basis. That, that's exactly right. That was the biggest threat of it. It would have, uh, it, it, legally, they could not have done that. You can't, you can't approve something under an emergency when it's not an emergency. There's an effective therapy available, so you couldn't take those risks. Dr. Vaughn, people are watching today and wondering if they know somebody or if they ha may have some of these problems, what are some treatments that can be done? I'm sure every case may be a little bit different. But what are the general treatments you're finding can work? And I'm going to ask Dr. Corey in case there's a difference. So a lot of what I do is look into the, the coagulation issue. So a lot of it is really addressing two things. One is platelets, and platelets are part of your, you know, if you were to look at these things forming kind of cl complexes, think of the platelets kind of as the bricks and the fibrin kind of as the mortar. So you kind of address both of those issues and tilt the body toward fibrinolysis, which is a fancy word for let's get rid of this sludge. And that's usually what I do. Now, I will say there's a lot of things that have been very helpful, just things like aspirin, things like natokinase, serapeptase, that have fibrinolytic properties that are things that are in foods and, and other health supplements that we've had for a long time. Those are things that I use as well. And so a lot of what we, basically me and Pierre use, is a mixture of things, a mixture in a good way, to address the different areas that the body's been targeting. But Dr. Corey, if people have gone to their doctor and they've, the doctors looked and said, I don't see any clots in your blood. And I know people that have been told this that have ended up with microclots that I guess couldn't be seen. What is your advice if someone feels like they've got a dead end, they can't really keep going to their doctor and insisting their doctor's wrong, how would you recommend they get treatment and what kind of treatments do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I first address that problem because it is really distressing for a patient. Um, you know, the, the challenge with the syndrome is so many of the tests, standard traditional test things do not reveal an abnormality, yet the patients remain very ill, and so they're looking for solutions. Um, what we know, and, and I really, you know, I want to put a call out that I, I really think that we need a new specialty and it, it, to study the disease of what I would call spikeopathy, because it's not only the clotting, clotting problems, but there's a number of other um, pathophysiologic processes that are triggered. And so I address beyond the clotting, there's a number of other things that I've found effective. So for instance, and I'll just list some of the mechanisms that we know. So macrophages, which is one of the immune cells, that gets activated to become hyperactive. We also have another immune uh, cell called the mast cell, and they, they all, uh, many of them develop mast cell activation syndrome, which actually can be triggered by clotting. Um, we see a lot of mitochondrial problems. That's what for, for, uh, for, uh, makes all the energy for the cells to, to remain functional. And so I address things that kind of suppress macrophages activity, suppress mast cell activity. Um, ivermectin has so many uh, mechanisms that in my experience, it's the most commonly effective drug, meaning I get a positive response in the highest proportion of patients with ivermectin. It's not everyone. I would say in my practice, about 70% of patients are ivermectin responders, some very large responses, some much more modest. Um, but that's proven to be a very effective drug. Another one is low-dose naltrexone, uh, which has also a number of um, immunomodulatory properties, and patients find great benefits from a lot of their nerve pains, um, sometimes fatigue and brain fog. Um, and then um, we also use um, things that suppress mast cells. So those are common medicines like antihistamines, things like Claritin and Zyrtec, um, and then uh, Pepsid, which also has histamine blocking. And then we use things that stabilize mast cells, some medicines that are a little less common like ketodafin. 
And so what, you're, what, you're, what I'm left with in a lot of patients is I'm able to get them better, but it takes sequential therapeutic trials, and sometimes their medication lists will grow. And if you look at the history of the disease, which really what is long COVID and long vax, it's almost identical to a long time described disease, which is called myalgic encephalitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. And if you look at the literature on that, and you look for the treatments over decades, it's very poorly studied. Not a lot of advances have been made in therapeutics, but you tend to see long lists of things that have worked. And this is what I found, that in the treatment of these patients is that almost everything I use, that, that I use works in some percentage. Nothing is 100%, and sometimes I'll see two patients, they present identical, Medicine A works great in the first patient and doesn't work well at all. And so it's very hard to understand what is the predominant mechanism that's triggering their symptoms. So sometimes it really is trials. But I, I will tell you that what is our guide? We use safe medicines that have been long been used, have excellent profiles of safety, and I put them on trials. I get a sense of when I should see a benefit. And if I don't, I get rid of it and we'll try something else. But I'm trying to relieve suffering. And I got to tell you, we generally get uh, consistent successes, but sometimes it takes uh, quite a few attempts. All right, fascinating. Stay where you are because when we return to this Full Measure Town Hall, we'll hear more from one of Dr. Vaughn's patients who's making a remarkable recovery and also from a pediatrician who foresaw many of these issues, but his warnings to the government fell on deaf ears. At my worst, um, I really couldn't get out of bed very much. Um, I was, we have five kids, so I was doing what I absolutely had to do to keep us going, but... Mm -hmm. I felt horrible all the time, and I was in bed um, most of the time. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Atkinson. For eight seasons, Sunday mornings must see for straightforward reporting. I'm Cheryl Atkinson in Cuba. Controversies involving the U.S. relationship. Questions all the way to the top. Have you been told to expect to be questioned? Around the world. In London. Zamboanga. Pennsylvania Amish country. Adding context to your world. Border Patrol never closes, sleeps, or stops. This is a story of a wife, mother of five, who all of a sudden watched her life change overnight and watched her health disintegrate slowly and surely over time. On this Your Voice, Your Future Full Measure Town Hall, we're talking about the COVID clots that some patients are experiencing after COVID and COVID vaccines, and the search for answers with so many people coming down with mystery illnesses. Joining me, Dr. Jordan Vaughn and Dr. Pierre Corey now, our patient Hannah Bourgeois and her husband, Dr. Gregory Bourgeois, and Dr. Patrick Whelan of the UCLA School of Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Whelan and all of you, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna start with you out of this block to ask about a letter that I found that you had written when the FDA was considering approving the initial vaccines and it seems to me now it serves as a prescient warning to what actually happened can you summarize what you wrote and what kind of response you got from the fda well in, in november of 2020 i chaired a session at our annual meeting the american college of rheumatology and it was about vascular problems related to covid so in the pediatrics clinics we started seeing patients that had purple toes purple fingers and it became termed COVID vasculopathy or COVID toes. And there were about a thousand rheumatologists that showed up uh, online for this uh, session that I chaired. And I came to appreciate as we were working through the information that we presented that day, that the material that was being used for the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines is exactly the same thing that causes all of the tissue damage associated with COVID itself. And when I started looking more deeply into it, it just seemed to me that this was something that was not being widely discussed. So just as a point of comparison, let's say that we were gonna develop a vaccine against tetanus, for instance, we wouldn't take the tetanus toxin and put it into people in order to protect them against tetanus toxin. We would inactivate it first and call it tetanus toxoid. But in this case, the COVID vaccines were themselves the principle of the disease itself, 
And there are a lot of things we could talk about, uh, you know, with regard to the uniqueness of this virus and the challenges that the vaccine uh, scientists faced. But basically, I tried to put into writing some concerns that I had on the eve of the first FDA hearing to assess whether the Pfizer vaccine should be licensed. And uh, basically, I never heard from the FDA. I mean, if I, so, understand, if I understand correctly, you basically said in advance what we know now is the case, that you saw there could be these vascular issues or the issues with what they call the small microvasculature, and that if the vaccines were approved and put into wide use without answering some of these questions, it could be sort of a disaster. I worried about that, especially taking care of children. And, you know, I knew that there was gonna be this big, uh, you know, impetus to try and get the vaccines out as quickly as possible and help to restore the economy. It's easy to understand why there was that, that push, but, I, I had hoped, and I think many of my colleagues had hoped, that there would be a very robust regimen uh, for following up on all the vaccinated patients. And ultimately, I joined a epidemiology group that published a paper about this last year in the journal Vaccine uh, in August of 2022. And we had a chance to actually go back and analyze all the data from the Moderna and Pfizer trials, the initial trial data. And we ultimately came up with a calculation of just how frequent serious adverse events were. And how frequent were they? So it turned out that they were pretty frequent. About one out of every 800 vaccinated individuals uh, developed some kind of an adverse event, according to what was called the, the Brighton Collaborative Criteria which were a set of criteria that were recognized by the World Health Organization right at the beginning of the epidemic based on what they were seeing among Chinese hospitalized patients. We took those criteria, we went back and analyzed the available clinical trial data from Pfizer and Moderna, and we showed basically that especially the Pfizer vaccine was associated with many more serious adverse events than uh, were acknowledged in the press releases that were produced right at the beginning well, of their it, campaign. It's, inter it's interesting you should say that because I was personally told by two experts or physicians along the way these words, the vaccines have no side effects. And I knew just from my reporting that every medicine has side effects. So when they say things like that to you, you wonder, does my doctor not know what he's talking about? Or are they, for some reason, have they all decided not to tell us the full story, which is upsetting. Hannah and Dr. Greg Bourgeois. Hannah, you have talked about what seems like to a really remarkable recovery, how you're pretty much bed bound. You'd been to Mayo Clinic, couldn't get help. And after being treated a fairly short period of time with Dr. Vaughn, you're out of bed walking in. I heard you were hiking not long ago. When you hear these warnings that were given by Dr. Whelan some time ago, what does that make you think about? Mm. Well, I try not to think about that <laughs> and, <laughs> and move forward, but um, I, I do know there was a lot that we didn't know, given that it was a pandemic with a new virus, at least as far as I understand. Um, but I think what I've, I've appreciated about Dr. Vaughn and the research that he's done is as we learn new things about it, that we change opinions about it and we can, um, you know, uh, see what we didn't understand at the beginning and seek to understand it better and not just stick to an opinion. So I, that would have been maybe my hope if I had looked back at that. Dr. Greg Bourgeois, I know being a medical doctor, hearing that some of this was at least in evidence for some people to see a couple of years ago and maybe could have been foretold if we had been a little bit more careful, not to second guess everything. Certainly everybody was in an emergency situation trying to find something that worked. But hearing Dr. Whelan say that he saw this evidence, what does that make you think? Dr. Whelan, I wish I had read your uh, response to the FDA then. 
Look, like so many physicians, I was thinking this was going to save us from the pandemic. With a new technology in terms of this mRNA vaccine, what I don't think we realized at the time is that literally giving the body just a piece of the virus and asking the body to make it would actually cause disease. We didn't know that, but there were folks like Dr. Whelan, others that saw warning signs. And uh, again, like Hannah just said, we've got to learn from what has happened. Well, thank you. It's so good to hear that Hannah is on a path to better health again. And I saw and heard a lot of stories like that when I visited Dr. Jordan Vaughn for my full measure report. In a moment, we're back on this full measure town hall with some practical information to help if you or someone you know might be suffering from a long COVID or long vax illness. You know, he comes in, he says, wow, you're making blood clots, and I don't know why. And so, but because I told him what I had the vaccine and, what, and I was feeling bad, he was obviously relating it, that it was vaccine related. The National Desk. A network of nearly 4,000 local journalists cover America's news now. It could be a matter of life and death. The National Desk covers our nation at the local level. You're not going to prevent every train crash, but you can make them less likely. To capture the pulse of America. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. Choose America's news now. Each weekday morning from the National Desk. I mean, my heart rate is going 200. I can't do it. And I went for like three, four months of just feeling awful. And so we shut down after that. We're back with the COVID clots, a special Your Vote, Your Future Full Measure Town Hall. The young lady we just heard from, another one of your patients, an athlete, Briefly, how's she doing since you've been treating her? She's doing great. Actually, she uh, ended up having one of the, the venous issues that we've discovered, which has to do with pelvic venous congestion and iliac vein compression. And actually... All uh, related to the spike all protein? All related to the spike protein, damaging the vasculature. Uh, she had that open back up, and actually she... Her dad is actually the coach at Sanford University, uh, which is in Birmingham, and she's back running again. She's not running at TCU because she had to come home uh, after the vaccine, but uh, since then she's back running again and has her life back, which is incredible. Good news. A couple of questions from Evelyn. She says, I had COVID in April of 2021, and this, I guess I'll ask Dr. Corey first. She says, I still have long-term COVID issues, staying tired, headaches out of nowhere, and bad hair loss. How long will the symptoms last? Ooh. Uh, it depends. It really depends on treatment and responses to treatment. But, you know, for the patients, uh, you know, many of the patients are chronically ill. You know, it, it really is a syndrome. It's a constellation of symptoms that develops in temporal association to either COVID or the vaccine. And the cardinal symptoms of this syndrome is really it's fatigue with what's called post-exertional malaise, which is patients when they try to exert themselves their fatigue just ramps up. They often have to be in bed sometimes for days and their other symptoms get worse. And then some amount of brain fog. Those are kind of the three things that I see in almost every one of my chronically ill patients. And then they come with a whole side list of symptoms. You know, how long will it last? Um, we have had patients fully recover, but if you look at the history of chronic fatigue syndrome, it's really only about 5% that fully recover. But what we try to do is we try to improve their functioning because functioning really is health and you try to bring them as close as they can to their prior level of function. And I've been very pleased with some of the responses that we've gotten, or many of the responses. And I'm telling you, we're learning more every day. Like Dr. Vaughn was saying, we collaborate, we share insights. I mean, there's a, we have a rich network of colleagues. And I would say every day we're getting better at treating these patients. And I think the future is bright as we, if we continue to do this work. Hannah Bourgeois, you've had treatment now. Gosh, has it been going on a few months? Tell us how long and how you're doing. Well, I met Dr. Vaughn in August of 2022, so it's been over a year now, and he put me on the triple anticoagulant therapy, and um, immediately after, it was within two weeks, I, it, I felt like a new person. 
it gave me my life back. Um, I, I could breathe, I could talk, um, I could walk, um, I could walk to my mailbox. Um, I, yes, I think right after, I would have told you I was 100%. Um, as I tried to do more, it was probably more 75 to 80% better, but compared to the 10 to 15% that I felt like I was living at, um, it was life-giving. From Maxine, another question. She says, I'll give this to Dr. Vaughn. Do the vaccines create nerve damage? When I take long walks, my foot tingles and I lose my balance. I never had this issue until I got the vaccine. So, it, I mean, there definitely is ways that the vaccine, uh, the spike protein can cause nerve damage, but in a lot of ways, some of the nerve damage that we call small, small fiber neuropathy, a lot of times can be related to what we would say lack of oxygen to the tissues themselves. And I think um, in addition, a lot of times the lower extremity issues that we're just now trying to elucidate have to do with not getting good venous return. Obviously your heart needs blood to pump when you demand it to pump it. And it's one thing to have good cardiac output, but good cardiac output without good cardiac input is gonna make you feel pretty bad. And so that's one of the, the things that we've kind of further found, especially in the lower extremities, that a lot of this tingling, neuropathy, even Hannah would probably tell you, you go to Mayo, you get a neurological workup, and the neurological workup itself is unrevealing. And so it's gotta be something different, and that's what we've found. Dr. Whelan, with all the talk of more another booster being approved and more COVID out there and more recommendations, what would you tell your pediatrician, your patients about what your recommendations are that they do? I think it's a very confusing time. And if you can make it kind of brief, I have another question too I'd like to squeeze in. Well, I think we should acknowledge that the vaccines have caused enormous good uh, in the aggregate that I took care of many, many COVID patients myself, including patients who died. And there are distinct subpopulations that are uniquely susceptible to the virus. Among pediatric patients, uh, basically obese children are far and away the most susceptible group and then immune deficient children. So the new vaccines concern me, the ones approved today by the FDA because Pfizer only released, uh, they've only done animal studies and Moderna has only analyzed data from 100 people. So I think that the jury is out on whether this new uh, array of vaccines is gonna be the answer. But um, I, I think that there are definitely some people who very much would benefit from being vaccinated and uh, you know I've mentioned who they are. Thank you so much. And for people who want help because they just don't know where to go, there are places online, both of you have, each of you has a website. Can you just give me 10, 15 seconds, someone searching for answers or something to show their doctor at home, what would you say? So, we, we, you know, the foundation that we have, the Microvascular Research Foundation, I think is gonna be something to really go and get data. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, overall uh, ability to take care of people is, is limited because of just time in general, but I'm hopeful, first of all, that patients take you know a little bit into their own hands and try to figure this out and try to seek help find a physician that cares about you and knows you because then they'll notice the difference and be able to hopefully help you and i think pierre is a good example of someone who's kind of stepped up and started to do it even more just a few seconds what can yeah. somebody do if they their doctor may mean well but not understand where the resources i would are? lead the doctor to my nonprofit website which is flccc.net and to go to the iRecover protocol. It's not so much a protocol, but it's a good guide of mechanistic based therapies that we know work. Um, and then it's for the doctor to start doctoring. But we, we give uh, a lot of information on how they can approach their patients and help them. Are you telling your patients just individually recommending whether to vaccinate with the new booster or not? What are your... Well, first of all, I think as Dr. Whelan pointed out, I mean, I think Moderna's 50 people on one and 50 on the other, they didn't even, I mean, it was all people that received either the bivalent or the monovalent. I mean, to me, that study in itself is inadequate to assess safety and efficacy. So, for, no so far? So, yeah, until, there, until there's better data. I'm gonna go much stronger. Um, these vaccines have unleashed a humanitarian catastrophe. They've been ineffective. The mo this is the most toxic protein I've ever studied, and it's unleashed did an epidemic of chronic illness. And I would not recommend any further COVID vaccines using this platform. 
You've all given us a lot to think about. You've done some really important research that I hope serves as a resource for everybody looking for answers. I'm afraid more and more people are going to be grappling with this. So a big thank you to all of our guests, and I do hope the information that we've put into the record here helps a lot of people. Rest assured, we're going to continue following this important topic. A quick reminder, we've begun our ninth season of Full Measure, my original investigative reporting program that airs every Sunday on this Sinclair station. Check your local listings for time. And thanks for watching the COVID Plots, a special Full Measure Town Hall. I'm Cheryl Ackeson.